Okay, um, let's talk about today. So as I mentioned last week that today is the uh, last lecture uh, for the course. So next week we will not have any lecture. So you can spend your time focusing on your assignments. And uh, because today is the last chance you are seeing, seeing me. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay, so today the main focus uh, will be on the review on what we have discussed throughout the course. And the first thing that we discussed technically was on the, the subject of object detection. So basically there are four pillars so four pillars of computer vision. So the first pillar is object detection. So this is the, one of the most important things, the most important task in computer vision is object detection or object recognition or recognition here. <clears throat> And the second pillar is 3D reconstruction or as a geometry. And the third pillar was motion analysis. And the last one is low level vision. Okay, so throughout the course, uh, we discussed all these four. And in particular, for object detection, we, our discussion focused on face detection. And at that time, the techniques that we uh, learned 
quite uh, deep actually was Pyla-Jones. Pyla-Jones algorithm of inspection. <clears throat> and this Pyla-Jones of face affection follow a machine learning framework. So machine learning framework. Right. And the framework here uh, consists of two stages. What are the two stages? Anyone? What are these uh, two stages of machine learning? Uh, no, no feature extraction. It's not modeling. Uh, this is a framework. Means that you know there are two stages, basically two stages in machine learning. It's not necessary, uh, but this is the things that we uh, the machine learning community do all the time. So what does what is that stages? Yeah, training and testing. So this one is training and testing. Again, these training and testing stages are not necessary. Human doesn't have this two stages, right? Human training and testing at the same time, not necessarily have to be in separate stage. Okay, but anyway, so this is the most common way of doing machine learning. Um, so in the training, for the training here, what is the input? Anyone remember what is the input of the training process? Data plus labels. And this kind of training is called what? Supervise. And the output is yeah, model parameters. In the testing, the input is what? Query data or test data. And what model parameters? And the output is obviously the label. Right. So in this case, uh, we have training and testing. But the other thing that in machine learning that is quite important, especially in computer vision or in, in many different fields, actually. Uh, Right, so the, the most important things in, in, we know that is in machine learning, especially in computer vision or in some of, of many different applications, the basic component here, or if you, or, or, or if you talk about the Jones algorithms, There are two basic components in the algorithms. What are these two basic components? Actually, you mentioned the first one before. Number one is features. And number two is what? If the basic component of Hila Jones. Number one is uh, features, and the other one is what? Anyone? It's classification. So the number one is uh, features, the second one is classification. Okay. <clears throat> right, so in the feature here, what kind of features that we use for filler terms? How like features? And in the feature extraction, the important step or the important process is what? What is the most important process in, uh, in, in extracting features? It's convolution. 
Compulsion operation. Okay. Right, so that is how we get the features. And for classification, what kind of classification that we use is other boost. And in other boost, there are two important concepts. And what are these two concepts? Well, actually three, but anyway, so two is also fine. What are these two co concepts in that's very important in other boost? There are three actually. Uh, what are the first one? What is the first one for other boost or boosting? What is the most important thing of boosting? It's called No one knows, no one remember. It is called weak classifiers. This is the main features of other boost that we have weak classifiers. And if you have weak classifier as the first feature, uh, the first important uh, characters of other boost, the second one is for, the second is for anyone. Strong classifier. Strong classifier is a combination of weak classifiers. And the second one, these two, what is the third one then that is important in other rules? It is weights, exactly. The weight is what happened with the weight. Adaptive, actually, yes, exactly. Because other boost is actually adaptive boosting, means that it's adaptive weights. What is the concept of adaptive weights here? What happened? What is the main uh, concept of other boost or, or adaptive weights? Give more weights to the wrong classified samples. So, give more weights to the wrong classified samples. <clears throat> okay, so that's the whole story here for training and testing. So you train you in the training, you extract the features from the input data, then you classify and the classification, but you use the reclassifier and combine them. Uh, using the adaptive weights. Right. Uh, any questions so far? What are these two are the main ingredients of Taylor Jones, but these two components only will not make the algorithm real time. To make the Face detection real time. What do you need to do then to make the algorithms real time? What do you need to do? There are two as well. So the third and the fourth components of the journey. What are these two? Anyone? Integral image and and the last one is called cascadiness. Okay, so this is uh, four concepts you need to know. Okay, so this is the full story of uh, the first part here. Well, actually not really the whole story. We still have the second part, actually. But anyway, so this one, uh, the most important things uh, for that part, for the object detection and recognition. Any, any questions? Once we have all this uh, discussion, then the focus shifted a bit on features. 
So the description seated to the features. So we already have hard light features. But aside from this hard light feature, we also have learned other features. And the other features was what? Seed, yes, uh, seed. But before this, we learn talk. Talk stands for. Yes, this so kind of oriented gradients. Okay, so the basic concept of talk here that you need to know one is, of course, the gradients, the concept of gradients. And this concept of gradients actually has something to do with convolutional operations. So you need to know that how to obtain gradients from convolution operation. There is a strong connection there. And the second concept is, of course, when we talk about gradients, gradients of an image or a pixels, we talk about a vector. And a vector has orientation and magnitude. So we talk about orientation and magnitude of gradient. Right. So that is the second important thing of, of talk. And the last thing is, of course, histogram. But well, it's not the last thing. Uh, aside from the histogram, we need to uh, convert this histogram into POC descriptors. POC uh, descriptors. So you need to know how to form POC descriptors from given an image. Any questions so far? Okay, so all right. So if there is no questions, uh, the next things that we discussed obviously is here. So first of all, why do we need shift? Anyone? Why do we need shift? Why? What is the most important thing about shift? That we need to see immediately, even you know today, even in in your a few uh, some of applications. Yes. Yeah. So, what kind of application in computer vision application that you need to see when you do what? When you do the image matching, right? Image matching is the core idea of SIF. You need to see when you want to match two images. Why is it so difficult to match two images? Even though we have the same object, to match two images of the same object is difficult. Why is that? Because these objects have some variance. Variance means that if you take from here one image and you take from there another image, it gives you a different perspective. Right? That's one problem. Variance is a big problem in image matching. And aside from these uh, different angles or different position of, of looking at the same object, we also have different distance to the object. So this is a scale problem. One, one time of the, when you take the image is small and uh, big, and the other time when you far away from the object, it becomes small. But they are the same object. So then the question is how we can match them, right? That is uh, one of the problem that motivates Steve is again is variance. So here is variance, image variance, and image variance of by one is the uh, perspective or angle of or angle, and second is from distance, right? Distance to the object, and what else aside from these two? Lighting, right? Lighting can be different because sometimes it's bright, sometimes it can be dim, but uh, the object is still the same. So lighting is lighting in terms of the intensity of the light, but lighting has another problem, which is 
start completely fancy people is another problem of lighting. Uh, yeah, shadows or uh, occlusion. Uh, I can put it shadows here. It's fine. What else? Intensity, shadows, and then what else? What can ca cause uh, uh, the object appearance to be different because of the lighting? Color, yes. Uh, so aside from color, what else? The distributions, light distributions. So uh, for example, now it's 100%, all the lights are on, but if I change some of them, maybe I just turn off this part, for example, the distribution will be different. My experience of the intensity will be different. For example, now you don't have any uh, shading in my face. Everything is frontal, uh, the same kind of light. But if I dim certain part of the light, it become dimmer here and brighter here, for example. So that's called uh, light distributions. So different light distributions can affect the appearance. Okay, so there's a lot of other things, but this is uh, one of the uh, significant variants that we can see in the image, in the object, when, they are, when we take the image of the object. Okay, so for C, there are four steps. What are the, the four steps? Number one. Anyone remember the first steps? It's not necessarily to be the exact term, not the official term, but you know, intuitively, what is the, the first steps uh, operation? What is the first step operation here? Yeah. Is to generate what? Exactly, to generate key points. Key points candidates. When we generate these key point candidates, what kind of operation that we have to use? Yeah, we have to generate the uh, difference of Gaussian, and then from difference of Gaussian, we try to find the not stable key points, but we do what uh, called extrema. What is it called? Uh, extremum detection, basically. Uh, so you try to find uh, the extrema from the neighboring pixels, the bottom pixels, and the above pixels. Right? So that's kind of a, a key point that you will get because you know that extrema. Extrema it means get can be the highest or can be the minimum. Anyway, so that's the generic key point candidate. And what is the problem with these uh, candidates? There are, many of them are not robust, you're unstable, right? What does it mean by unstable? When we say that the key points is not, is not stable, what does it mean by that? Yes, uh, means that when we have two images, there are not, repeatedly generated, right? We take from here, for example, that key points is detected, but when we take from here, the same point is not detected anymore. So that one is, is unstable. And we don't want to have this because the matching process will be influenced by this, will be affected by this. So we want to have a stable key points. And uh, for that one, we need to do filtering. Filters unstable key points. When we try to filter out unstable key points, so this one is filtering out unstable key points. What is the definition of these unstable key points? There are two considered to be unstable. The first one is what? The second one is edges. Uh, yes, the second one is edges. The first one is what? The intensity of the DOG is below a certain threshold. Right? So the intensity below or, or the contrast, actually, the contrast in the image space, but the intensity in the DOG space 
below threshold. It means that the contrast between, uh, because basically what we want, if it, it is not edges, then it has to be corners. The corner contrast is not that high. It means that the gradients at that corner is not that significantly high. It's just very small gradients. If it is small gradients, any object can have small gradients. Even noise can have a small gradients. But if it is very large, very high, in terms of the intensity of the OG, the contrast is high, then it's a significant gradient. I mean, that it's, it's, it will be uh, indicating the robust uh, key points. Okay, so there is a second step in C. And the third one is what? After we get the stable key points, what is the next challenge? Is the is the orientation okay rotation especially so we want to have assignment or assign orientation and for this one we have to create histogram histogram of gradient histogram of oriented gradient. From histogram of all the gradients, we try to find the peak of 16 by 16 patch. Then we shift this peak into the y axis. So that is the reference, the reference angle, the reference orientation. And we shift to, we do the same operation for, for any key points. So then in the end, we will have a reference key point, which is zero degree. So everything has to be rotated in such a way that the degree. Of the angle of the, of the rotation to be zero. Okay, so that's solve the orientation problem, and the last step is what to generate what we yeah. have to generate descriptors. <laughs> descriptor is the factors that you will use to do the matching. After you get the key points, you have the factors, and then the factors will be used for the matching problem. But do we want to select the descriptor? And that can be yeah. So please keep in mind how, how you can get the 128. Okay, so a bit of information on the exam. The exam will be multiple responses. So one question will consist of four uh, choices and there may be more than one of the choices are correct or none. Maybe there's none of the choices are correct. So that's something that you have to judge. So you can put a uh, true and false for each of these uh, letters A, B, C, D. So for A, for example, if you think that it's wrong, wrong statement, for example, then you can just put F, but not only just putting F, you need to put a, or to write the justification. So after the, the, let, the letter of whether this is right or wrong, false or, or true, then you have to write your justification. Without justification, although your letter is correct, you will not get a point. So the justification has to be there and correct. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, a bit of information on exam. Any questions on that? Yes. Uh, well, there is an opportunity always for you to justify. For example, why this is correct. Yeah, so for example, uh, I make a statement that uh, the safe descriptor is 128. So you have to justify. How can you get this 128? Right? So that is the justification. All right, so you have to prove that the statement is correct, or you have to prove that the statement is wrong.
All right. Any other questions? So one question for selections. Yes. That's a good question. How many questions? It's a, in total, it's 10 questions. 10 questions means that you have to justify 40 statements. Okay, so be careful with the time. The time is two hours. Okay, any other question? Yes. Yes, the mathematical proof uh, ask, uh, can be asked. Not only words, no, there is a definite uh, instruction that you have to prove mathematically. So it's written in your justification, you have to prove mathematically. Not every segment, only a few of them. Now, the good thing is that you are allowed to bring a cheat sheet. Do you know the meaning of cheat sheet, right? Yeah, so one A4 paper, whatever you like to write on, your, on the A4 paper. Okay. Any other questions? There will be things that I prove in that Yeah. Yeah. There will be a, a instruction, explicit instruction that you have to prove mathematically. Any, of course, if it is not in, instructed explicitly, feel free uh, to write the mathematical proof if you think that will support your justification. So my suggestion to deal with this is that work on the statements, justification that you know already, you know, quickly done that first and then return to the point that when you are stuck, because that one will make you, your, your, your process faster. Don't think of, you know, you, you go sequentially and then you get stuck there and then you try to solve that uh, for a few minutes, then you know you will not have time for the rest. So that's the strategy that I suggest to you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes? Everything is covered in lecture notes, everything is covered in the reading material. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, we have to go over the uh, lecture notes as well as the reading material. Yes, the reading material because lecture notes is actually taken from reading material. So if you if you have a lecture only from the lecture note, the discussion will be very short because I summarize from the reading material. So it's not complete. The lecture note is not complete. Of, of course, yes, because that's the source of the information that I get from, right? So the lecture notes is actually taken from the reading material. You should know that, right? Uh, I think some of you know that because some of you actually ask question to me, not not referring to the to the lecture note, but referring to the uh, reading materials. Again, the reading material is more complete, more deep in terms of the discussion. Any other questions? Okay, so let's continue then with the review. Uh, so this is the, the step you see. Uh, do you have any questions here? Do you have any questions? Okay. Do you have any questions with respect to the to the exam or the grading? Yes. Oh uh, yeah, if it's not not in that way. Uh, if it is a mathematical proof, it will be a short mathematical proof. It's not really, you know, more than one page. No. But that if that's the case, you know, it's easier for you for those who have a cheat sheet, that will be easy. But that's not the case. Uh, so it is not exactly like in the lecture. Any other questions? So to be honest with you, uh, it will the grading. Uh, well, I will take uh, the natural what it is the raw grade that you have, but because the number here is the class number, I mean the the students number here is large. 
then more or less it will be a Gaussian uh, Gaussian grading. Right? Uh, yeah. Any other questions here? So in other words, your performance depends on other students' performance relative to other students' performance. So in that case, it's good, bad, and good because you don't you feel good because you know uh, it's not necessarily that you you are bad. It, your grade will be bad because it depends on the population, uh, the scores in the population. Okay. Any other questions here? How much space uh, for each option in CP will we have for our students? Like, is it just in I, I'm not really sure. It's difficult to, to answer that because it's individual uh, judgment uh, on how much that you want to spend on, uh, on the justification. But I would say that, uh, you know, one page, uh, one question. I would say that. Not one statement, but one question. Okay, so if there's 10 questions, then will be 10 pages of answers. Right? That's the rough idea that I have in mind. But it's not necessary to be in that way. It's really up to you individually on how much that you want to spend on the justification. But you have to be careful because the time is quite uh, limited, only two hours. Any other questions here? Yes. Coding, uh, yeah, coding, that's a good question. It's possible uh, coding, yes, uh, but it will be not long coding. Like, uh, you know, I asked you to do the Viola Jones algorithm for the poll, for example. If there is a coding, that will be not that long kind of coding. Yeah. Any other questions here? Because justification for coding is very difficult, right? Uh, I cannot imagine what kind of statement that you need to prove with coding. Uh, so, uh, I think it's very rare. I don't think that will be the case. Uh, but if it is according to questions, you know, I write the algorithms, then you judge whether this is correct algorithm or not, or something like that. Any other questions here? <clears throat> okay, so if not, then let's continue with the uh, review. So once we finish with uh, C, the next topic was uh, to have the SIP application. So SIP application. <coughs> and the SIP application that we discussed was image stitching. This is actually your uh, assignment. <coughs> and image stitching, uh, there are a few concepts that is important. It is uh, what is key point matching. That's one thing that you have to know. The other concept that is important is inhomogeneous coordinate. You have to know what, why we have to use, uh, sorry, homogeneous coordinate, not inhomogeneous, but homogeneous coordinate. And we also have uh, different transformation when we talk about uh, uh, transforming from one image to another image, we talk about general transformation like Euclidean uh, rotation, translation, scaling, uh, projection, and so on. And the other things that we learn is homography. As you know that homography is very important in our case, so you really need to know that. And as a homography, we also learn about brand size. Okay. So this is a, a few concepts that are important in our discussion on image teaching. Okay, any questions here for this? Uh, five concept here. So when we talk about homography, when we discuss about homography, we also learn about SPT, single value decomposition. Okay, so if there is no questions, uh, that's all actually for, for image teaching. This one is actually lecture four. And in lecture five,
we discuss about camera geometry. And in camera geometry, one of the important concepts is coordinates. We have three different coordinates. So what are these three coordinates? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, it's what yes. world coordinate. And then the second one, coming up coordinate. And the third one, in Okay, so that is about the coordinates. And from, from this coordinate, transforming from one to another, in the end of the day, we have to transform the world into the image. And for transforming the world into the image, we need to have a matrix. And what is the matrix called? Camera matrix. And if the camera matrix is represented by P, P equal to what? KRP. And K here is has a name. Yeah, this is called intrinsic parameters. And RP is called extrinsic. Okay, so and we also learn about this is called forward projection. Uh, so we have a two type of projection. So the first one is a forward projection, and the other one is backward projection. Forward projection is very simple: x r equal to p x w. So this one is called forward projection. Backward projection is more difficult. For forward projection is from the camera to the world. So in this case, a point, a point becomes what? Becomes line. Yeah, line becomes plane. And plane becomes yeah, cone or volume. <clears throat> so that's the basic idea of vector projection. You need to know how to do this vector projection. Okay, because that's the, the main idea. If you understand vector projection, you understand camera matrix. <clears throat> okay, so the next concept, important concept in camera geometry is camera calibration. <clears throat> Again, uh, in the camera calibration, you use uh, RCD. Right, so today's lecture five. In lecture five, we also uh, Learn about two view geometry, two view geometry. And when we discuss about two view geometry, we learn we learn about antipolar geometry, antipolar geometry. <clears throat> and antipolar geometry. We have a few different concepts. Uh, one of them is called antipole. So you need to know the meaning of antipole. We also learn about antipole line. And we also learn about basis line. Right. So this is uh, three different terms that you need to know. Uh, this is part, all this part of uh to geometry and in this two view we also learn about fundamental metric so in fundamental matrix there are two important equations first equation is to find the the matrix to calculate the fundamental matrix and the calculation of fundamental matrix follow x prime transpose and x equal to zero so in this case x prime and x are given to you, the pair are given to you, maybe using seeds, so then you know that there are corresponding points, and once you know the corresponding points, then you can compute f from this equation. 
That's why this equation is important because this equation is used to find M, fundamental matrix. So once we have fundamental matrix, then the application, the important application is to find L prime equal to F X prime. Oh, sorry, X bar. So this means that uh, for X on the left, using F, you can have a line on the right image. That's the, this line will guarantee you that it will pass uh, the same point, uh, the, uh, not the same point, but the corresponding points of X. Right, so there is a, a correlation between F and H when, when F uh, <clears throat> is the cross of uh, the skewed matrix of E of uh, FFO multiplied by H. <clears throat> Okay, so this is the correlation between F and H. H is homography as a fundamental matrix. But it doesn't mean that it is one to, to one correspondence. Because, you know, in two images, there are many different edges, there are many different matrix of H, but there's only one F. So you can have many H, but in the end, you will have only one F. Why this is the case? Because E here, skewed matrix, will eliminate some of the information. So that's why you will have the same A, F, single F, from different values of H, homography. Homography is only depends on the plane. If there are many planes, then there are many different values of H. But F depends on the image, depends on the epipolar geometry. Once that's fixed, you only have one F. Okay, so be careful with this. Any questions here? The correlation between fundamental matrix and homography or fundamental, fundamental matrix in general. Okay, so that's for the lectures five. In lecture six, we discussed about stereo and Markov random field. In stereo here, uh, in the first thing that we discussed in stereo was a disparity map. Disparity map is when we dealing with, uh, particularly uh, in the first example that I gave to you, I used rectified images. Rectified images is when the Y are the same on the X are different. That is called rectified images. And using these rectified images, we can just use horizontal line to find the corresponding points. And once we can get the corresponding points, then we can have the disparity value of the target pixels. So from this rectified image, we can have uh, the prediction of the disparity and the disparity is inverse, the inverse of uh, that. So that's uh, the things uh, that we discussed. And when we do the matching of the pixels, we can do the matching pixel by pixels, or we can use patches centered at that pixels. Right? So then the problem is that if it is only one pixel or small patch, what happened with the disparity map? It will be noisy. But if it is, if we enlarge the patch, it will be less noisy, but what? The preciseness of the depth will not be there. In other words, the depth estimation will not be precise or accurate. So we have this dilemma there. And we solve this dilemma using Markov random field, using a uh, graphical model. Uh, Markov random field. And the basic component of this graphical model that you have to know is that it is uh, based on what is called factorization. You need to know about this concept, factorization. Right? Uh, factorization means that. Ideally, we have to connect all the pixels and make them independent to each other. It means that we have to have a joint probability for all, all the pixels. 
That would be ideal. That would be global optimization. But to compute this is very, very expensive. Then we have to cut, to cut the connection, to cut the dependencies uh, between pixels, right? And what is the best way to cut the connection between pixels is using Markovianity, using local connection. So you don't need to connect one pixel to another pixel for all the pixels, but you just connect pixels based on the neighboring pixels. And that is called Markovianity. And that's actually the basic concept of factorization. Okay, so you need to know the idea of factorization. It's something to do with conditional distribution, conditional uh, distribution, conditional probability. Okay, because of this factorization, then now Markov random field is possible and the optimization can be done globally, but the expression of Markov random field is local. So the, the we have uh, error function of x that depends on the sum of x, x is the pixels location, f d of x and d at x so, uh, so let, let's say that it is, it is a depth estimation for example then you have uh, d of x uh, d, d, um, yeah so anyway so d and i x i is the observation d is the depth for example and plus uh, Y, Y is the neighbor of X, and then we have P, D, X, D, Y. So the expression here is local. So this one is local expression. But if you combine using Markov and the field, it becomes a, a, a full graph for the whole image. And then the optimization can be can be done using uh, graph optimization. And for this graph optimization, we learn about uh, graph cuts. And the beauty of this graph cut is that we don't need to have these patches anymore. We don't need really depends on the size. Uh, the, we don't really need to decide the size of the patch because this can be uh, automatically done. Uh, during the optimization. Okay. So that's the beauty of this uh, uh, graph of global graph optimization. Although the expression is local, uh, but the optimization can be done globally. Any questions here for Markov and Field? Okay, so that's uh, lecture six and lecture seven. Uh, Actually, the continuation of this uh, lecture seven is actually that from video. So we talk about more details on the case how we can define this Markov in the field, and this is part of your current assignment. So I think you know uh, all the things the details of this already. So I will not. Further, unless you have questions. Any questions on the depth from video? Okay, so if you don't have any question on depth from video, the next topic uh, in lecture eight is optical flow. So optical flow is different from motion field. So it is not the same as motion field. And for optical flow, we have two techniques. One is Lucas and Kanadi, and the other is Horn and Scar. Lucas and Kanadi is a local and sparse optical flow. And Lucas Kanadi also 
use uh, PCC, which is brightness constancy constraint. And unlike look at the current day, on X scan is a global and dense. And to solve this uh, global optimization, so this is a global optimization, global optimization, uh, they use Euler Lagrange equations. And Gauss Schiedel's. So the use cause see the uh, method for musician. <coughs> So this is the two concepts that you need to understand uh, in Connex scan. Okay, so now our focus was on Connex scan, and we know that there are some a few secrets that or recipe to make it more robust. So we discuss about robust. Optical flow, robust optical flow, and in the robust optical flow, uh, there are a few ingredients here. First is robust objective function, we also have cost to find mechanism, cost to find. We also learn about interpolation. We learn about medium filtering. We learn about GCC and structure texture decomposition. And in structure texture decomposition, uh, we learn about ROS, Rudin um, Osser Patani algorithms. And this ROF is basically TV regularization, total variation regularization. And from the TV regularization, we learn about L1 and L2 difference. L1 and L2 norms uh, differences, especially in the optimization side. Any questions so far? So this is the whole uh, story uh, of in our lecture, in our course. So from uh, Tela Jones algorithm for face detection until uh, ROF. TV uh, regularization. Any questions, anyone? Yes. How the grading of the structure? You know, we have ten sections uh, and four statements for each side. Yeah. And uh, is the grading the section based grading or the statement? They are uniform. Uniform means that one questions give you ten points. So if I uh, identify only the subset of the correct statement. Yeah, so one, 10 points for one question, there are four statements, then each statement gives you 2.5. Uh, yeah, uniform across all the statements. Okay, good questions. Any other questions? Again, if there is no Justification of the justification is wrong, then there will be no points, there will be zero points. Uh, 
No questions? Okay, so good. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the topic from last week, last week we still discussed about the ROF, so that included. So after this point, it's included. So then after that, I discussed about power constancy based on specularity. That one is not included. So the point is up to this point that will be included in the exam. So even for today that I will discuss about deep learning will not be included as well. Any other questions? So obviously, uh, you know, not all questions will be difficult in my view. <laughs> in my view, all the, you know, I try to divide uh, between basic, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, so, you know, but please uh, study seriously so then you can uh, have a good grades, even though, you know, uh, there are some questions that may be basics for you. Okay, so that's all the, the topics. Uh, so the topic again is up to ROF uh, algorithms. Any other questions before I move to the next thing, uh, which is deep learning? I will talk about deep learning, the corresponding deep learning in these topics. Right? So you can differentiate what is a state of the art deep learning methods and the basic conventional computer vision methods. Okay, so let's have a quick discussion on deep learning then. So this one is a deep learning in computer vision. Um, so first of all, I just want to give a broad uh, introduction on the deep learning concept. I know that some of you are already expert in deep learning. So uh, for those, maybe it's a bit boring, but I also noticed that some of you don't have the background on deep learning. So the basic idea of deep learning is that deep learning uh, is not the same as brain. It is only inspired. Okay, so some people think that deep learning is the same as how the brain works. It is wrong. Uh, deep learning is not the same as how the brain works. For example, backpropagation is not in our brain. Backpropagation is only in deep learning. Uh, so we have different kind of feedback mechanism in our brain and honestly to be backpropagation. Anyway, so uh, the basic concept of deep learning start from uh, this so-called, uh, the term is uh, it's called perceptron. Perceptron is, uh, is uh, one neuron and one neuron, when we say neuron, is uh, consists of weights, W here, and, and inputs, so one, X1, X2, Xn are the input, Ws are the parameters of the models, and then you sum them. So what is the, the idea here? The idea is the same like, you know, you yourself, imagine that you are the, the neuron, and the neuron works on making the deci a decision. So given an input, then you have to make a decision based on the weights that you put on each of these uh, input. So for example, uh, if you are a boy, then imagine that a girl asks you to have a dinner. Or if you are a girl, then imagine that a boy asks you to have a dinner with, with him. So that is one input. So the decision that you have to make is that whether you want to go with him or her for dinner, right? That's one input. And the second input, for example, your mom suddenly call you and to have to want to have a dinner with you at the same time, right? Uh, and it's already some time that you haven't had any dinner with your mom. So that depends on how much weight that you put on these two factors, right? If you put weights on the boy or the girls, then you will your decision will go with the boy or the girl. But if you put more, more weights on your mom, then you will go with your mom. So the decision will go to your mom. So that's the, exactly the same as what we have here. So the decision is based on the weight. So the weight is very important. And in deep learning, this weight is learned automatically without the inter intervention of humans. So that's the basic concept of neuron, one a decision maker, very small decision maker. But when you aggregate this one, when you have many, many, many uh, neurons, so the neurons will 
try to uh, comp or try to give more information to the next neuron and so on and so forth. Okay, so the the configuration, if you have many, many neurons and many, many layers, the configuration and the process of, of making decision become very complex. We do not know exactly what is going on in the in deep learning. So that's why some people say that deep learning is a black box. No one knows how the decision is made because the decision is made based on these weights uh, that is decided automatically by, by the network based on tech rotation. And we do not know exactly how this uh, come up to a certain decision. And that's a good and bad thing. The good thing is that deep learning, because it's learned by itself, without inter intervention for human, can make a decision or solve a problem beyond human capability. So for human, it's very difficult to us, for us, for example, to process multiple huge data. But for network, it will be easy to deal with this. So that's why some people worry about this kind of deep learning because this can go beyond human understanding. So basically, that's the idea of multi-layer perceptron when you combine uh, many, many neurons into one network. And now the question is how we can compute these neuron weights, right? So we talk about the weights and we talk about that these weights is uh, learned automatically. But now, what is the idea there? If it is supervised learning, then you need to describe or to define your error function. The same as what we did in this course, we also have an error function, and that's something that we have to define. In this case, the error function is supervised error function, means that you have grown truth aside from your prediction. Okay? If it is unsupervised, you still need to have error function, but the error function without ground truth. So that will be called unsupervised error function. Now, once we have the error function, once we have this uh, definition of the error, then we backpropagate this using derivative, using gradients. So the gradients or the derivative of the error will be sent back uh, to the, to the uh, previous layers and previous or previous layers and so on and so forth. So then we can adjust uh, the the value of your of your weights, and so why this is called deep neural network? What is the difference between neural network and deep neural network or deep learning? Well, they're the same thing. Uh, neural network in the beginning, because of the of the restriction of the device, the hardware, they cannot make many many layers. They only have a shallow layers, and that's the the idea of neural network shallow shallow layers of networks or, or, or neurons. But then because we have a very powerful GPU or machine, then we can have many, many layers. And that's why it's called deep neural network or becomes deep learning. So deep learning is a brand new brand. It's a, for the purpose of branding. So previously it's a neural network because neural network lost the popularity in 90s people despise uh, uh, or look down on, on, on neural network, then the people behind neural network try to rebrand uh, the, the concept and call it deep learning, right? So this is just uh, for the purpose of, uh, of, of marketing. Okay? So deep learning is actually the same as neural network. So anyway, so the, the thing is that the backpropagation try to minimize the error. So the error over the time of the learning process has to be smaller and smaller, but it's not necessary to be optimum. So backpropagation can be trapped into local minimum. But that's something that you have to check. So if you are deep learning researcher, you have to check your minimum uh, convergence. So if you're the, converge, the convergence line or the error line is not below the, the, the value that you expected means that it's trapped into a local minimum. And whether this is acceptable or not depends on you. Sometimes even though it's trapped in the local minimum, it is still acceptable. It means that the performance is still good, right? So, and that one has to be checked manually, unfortunately. So when you train a network, always look at your curve, uh, the training curve, because that is important. You cannot just ignore the training curve. 
the training curve will show you whether this is converging or not and whether this converge points is something that you want to have whether this is small enough or not sometimes it is not converged I mean that is fluctuating if it is fluctuating that is not learning anything or if this converts too fast and it is uh, you know get into your overfitting problem so there's a lot of things that you have to take care uh, in the in the training curve so please when you do research in deep learning look at that training curve because otherwise you will not know whether this work or not so there's something to do with underperformance and overfitting uh, underfitting and overfitting problems another concept that's very important in deep learning is called convolutional neural network so we learn this concept of convolution. So convolution is something like this, that you convolve uh, a few pixels. So imagine that you have a pixels here, you convolve this one using convolution operation. So the green line here is the convolution operation described in this equation. So this is uh, integral here or sum here, are actually convolution. Convolution between A and W. So W here is called kernel which we the same as our kernel, whether this is uh, uh, you know, Gaussian kernel, or this is a, a Sobel kernel, or any kernel is here. W is your kernel, and A is your input, right? So this one, if you imagine that it's two-dimensional space, then it is a convolution to be convolution, and that's what we have here. So the kernel or W here, is adjusted based on the backpropagation, based on the learning process. So it's not decided by us, but it's decided by the learning process. So that's the beauty of this. The power of machine learning, the power of deep learning, why it's so successful nowadays is because of this. This one page here is representing the whole uh, development breakthrough uh, in AI. So when you have the convolutional network, then you can do this again and again for many layers, and then you will get features. So in the end here, uh, from this convolutional process, you get features. And once you get features, then the next step is to use fully connected layers, not convolution. It's just normal one-dimensional, one-factor operation, and then you can classify. So there are two steps basically in deep learning. One is the called feature extraction, which is this one, using convolutional network and using FCN, fully connected layers, to do the classification. So exactly the same like Phila Jones. In Phila Jones, we also have feature extraction followed by other boost. Okay, so people learn from there and they have this uh, kind of idea of two stages of process. Okay, so there's uh, uh, CNN, Convolutional Neural Network. So this is the idea of uh, Linet 5. So Linet 5 using these, uh, you know, handwritten digits and labels. So there's the label for each of these. And then you can train this network using the labels. And then uh, you, this is a, so successful at that time. It's 1997, around that time. And in Bell Lab uh, by uh, the guy, uh, Jan Le Kuhn. And it is used in uh, American post office uh, to get the zip code uh, from the letter, from the letters, I mean. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And if you can use this uh, for, for face detection, like in Phila Jones. And what you see here, if you look at the uh, features representation for each of the layers here, it will produce features. So the first layers look like this, look like edges and corners. So this is called primitive features. Primitive features will consist of very local features like edges and corners, and it is extracted in the beginning of the layers. And in the next layers, it will be more abstract, but still local. So for the next step, for example, here layer two, more abstract, more, more, more capturing the, the bigger picture, but still local. So eyes, mouth, ears, and so on, right? And the next layer will be more abstract, will be more global. In this case, the whole face uh, features of the input. So that's how it works. We can we know this one, how, how the, uh, the features look like, but we don't have any control on this because everything is learned automatically. But that's a, a, a important concept here that, you know, 
uh, that primitive features is used also in deep learning, like what we did in Fela Jones. In Fela Jones, we use R features, also try to extract these uh, local features. And anyway, so um, another important concept in deep learning is called autoencoders. So previously, if you look at CNN, right, uh, the this one, the input is image, the output is label, whether this is bird or dog. This is called classification network, or, or in this case, uh, yeah, classification. So in machine learning, we have classification and regression. So this is belongs to classification. And autoencoder belongs to regression. Why? Because our input is image, the output is also image, means the value of the maps. So if you consider there's a map here, so the value of this map from zero to two five five, or in this case zero to or one, is the prediction whether we have zero or one, or we want to have a zero to two five five, for example. So this is called regression problem. It is called autoencoder. Autoencoder means that the input is image, the output is also image or map, not labels. And the, why this autoencoder is important because this feature here in the middle is a code and this code represents your input image. So the input image is compressed in such a way that the code only consists or only has the information that is very important with respect to the input image. Because from these very small uh, features, very small code, you can extract back uh, to this input image. So it, it's like compression, right? So it's compressed so much uh, that small compression means the presentation of the image because you can generate an, an, an image uh, that exactly the same as this input image based on the code here. So that's why autoencoder is very important for feature extraction. Okay, anyway, so another important concept that is a breakthrough as well in deep learning is called GAN or Generative Neural Adversarial Network. So Generative Adversarial Network is quite important uh, concept and it's quite interesting because imagine that you have noise as your input. Yeah? It's just noise, not, nothing there. And then you have uh, uh, a module called generator, and you can imagine that generator is a blind painter. It's very good in painting, but it's, it just cannot see anything, it's blind. And imagine that we want this generator, this blind person, blind of paint, painter, to draw Mona Lisa. Is it possible or not, right? Imagine you have a blind person and you ask the blind person to draw Mona Lisa. And this person, the, paint, the blind painter, blind since he's born. So he doesn't know anything about the world and let alone Mona Lisa. So, but the idea of generative neural network is, uh, or uh, so network is that you have a person, a detective or discriminator here, that can see Mona Lisa, but cannot paint. He cannot, he can just say yes or no. Yes or no with respect to Mona Lisa. If the painting is look like Mona Lisa, he will say yes. But if the painting of the blind painters doesn't look like Mona Lisa, then he will say to the painters, no, it's wrong. So this process in the beginning is very wrong, as you can imagine. The painting here will be very wrong, but the detective here say, no, you are wrong. So based on this feedback, then he will modify the painter, the painting here. He modified the painting and then he just give, uh, give to, to the detective and the detective will judge again whether this is right or wrong. And if this is still wrong, then the, the, the painter will do it again and again and again and again until the detective say yes, All right? So there is a back provocation here, so back feeding here from the detective to the, to, the, to the painters in such a way until the painters can draw a correct Mona Lisa that cannot be distinguished from the true Mona Lisa. So this can is so important, uh, so breakthrough at that time that there is a new password in, in, in public space in, uh, in even for lay people uh, that they know about deep fake. You, how many of you learned about, or heard about deep fake? Yeah, deep fake means that, you know, the video is actually not true. It's just a synthetic uh, uh, video, but it's look like very real. 
So this one is called deep fake, and especially for face. So your face is very dangerous actually if you put in the internet on your Facebook, for example, because people can make it make deep fake out of your face. And deep fake is possible because of can because of this technology generative social network. So this one, for example, we have noise here. So the fake image is number eight because we have reference data uh, from these all digits. Right, so now that's the whole basic concept of deep learning. So what is the application here? Uh, so first is of all is classification. In classification, given an image, the classification is very simple, whether there is a cap or not in the image. So given an image, you can say yes or no. Yes means that there is a cap in the image. No means that there's no cat in the image. It's very simple, but it can be very difficult uh, because for the right image here, what do you think? Yes or no? On the right image, uh, what is there a, a cat in the image? Yes. Where is that? The black one, exactly. Not this, this, not this one, but this one here. Okay, so th there's a cat here. So the problem statement is very simple, but it can be very difficult. And neural network can done it easily. If you put uh, many, many, many images uh, for training, it can be done uh, quite easily. So that's the problem of classification, yes or no for certain statement. And this classification can be done uh, using VGG, or uh, this is called network, uh, VGG net. And VGG net is basically given this input image, you have many, many, many convolution. So this one is convolutional neural network, so small, and then uh, it's almost like a, you know only one by one thousand kind of code factors, and from this vector, then you can do the classification whether this is a, a, a image have a cat or not, and this is so powerful at that time that it used a lot. So this one is used a lot in image classification, but the problem with this is that if you extend these layers uh, to have more layers. That's a problem. And the, what is the problem of this? Many, many layers. What is the problem here? It's called? Yes, gradient walk. It's called diminishing gradients. Diminishing gradient or explosive uh, explosion, uh, gradient explosion, basically, right? Gradient explosion, mean, if the diminishing gradient means that the back propagation of the gradient becomes small and small and small. And there is no gradients uh, for the rest of the of the of the layers. So that's called diminishing gradients. Means that the network cannot learn because there's no gradients. Or uh, there is a gradient explosion. Means that if the gradient is so big, is is multiplicated uh, more and more and more, it becomes big and big and big and big, and then it becomes saturated. Uh, the learning process becomes saturated. So that's the problem of this deep network at that time. And the solution of this is ResNet. So ResNet using skip connection to deal with this diminishing gradient problem or explosion of the gradients. Because now there's no gradients uh, for this skip, skip connection, there will be no reduction of the value of, of the gradients. So the gradients can, can flow into this skip connection. And that's why ResNet become very famous and the, and the inventor of this ResNet become very rich. Right, uh, the person is uh, from Tsinghua University, uh, and and then yeah, finished in the HKUST in Hong Kong, but now he's already in Facebook, uh, and I think it's very very rich now. Um, yeah, if you look at the citation of for computer vision on Google Scholar, now he's on the top uh, of the whole uh, community. So uh, as I mentioned again, uh, normally. You know, uh, people in research use Google Scholar uh, for. I'm showing this because I want to encourage you, uh, you know, uh, to be like him if possible. Uh, so, so it's Google Scholar here. Uh, so Andrew Zimmerman is the big guy in computer vision. Andrew Zimmerman is from Oxford University, right? Uh, Andrew, I have 323,000 citations, right? So this is, uh, he's very famous. He's, uh, he's a dominant player in, in computer vision. 
But if you look at computer vision and you click computer vision, number one is Kaiming. Right? Uh, Kaiming is the one, the inventor of ResNet. Is uh, more than even more than Andrew Sisman. Right? So uh, uh, unfortunately, Jensen already passed away. Uh, he's a um, director of um, MacP, the the inventor of one of the inventors of of ResNet. Uh, so another, I just want to show you that you know these people. Uh, you know Takio Kanade. Kanade is Lucas and Kanade. It's actually, I just want to know the you know how how far uh climbing achievements because Takio Kanade, which is very famous also in computer vision, only 141. Of course, it's uh, in all generation, not in the deep learning generation. So that's why the citation is not that high. But you you see that the magnitude of, of that citation of climbing. So it's very, very significant. So now everyone, whenever he publishes, everyone follow him. So that's why citation become double uh, and more and more. But anyway, so okay, so that's the ResNet is a breakthrough uh, in in computer vision uh, because it can deal with the problem of diminishing gradients. And okay, so. Another, another topic that we discuss uh, is object detection, which is in our case is face detection, right? So here is a general object detection or localization. In this case, it's not just face, but any objects like a dog here, aside from the label that is a dog, you also know the location of the dog, the bonding box. So you know the bonding box of the bicycle and you know the, that is bicycle. You know the bonding box of the car and you know the label of the car. So this one is uh, this kind of task, is called object localization. We localize the location of the object and keep the label. Okay, so how we can solve this problem uh, in using deep learning? First of all, uh, in the beginning, people use this RCNN. RCNN concept is very simple. Given an input image, you extract region proposal. This region proposal is through segmentation. So you do simple segmentation. You have a bonding box for every segmented pixels. And then you use this as a region proposal. It's manual region proposal using semantic seg using segmentation or color segmentation. Uh, and once you have these proposals, uh, then you put this proposal for each of them on the CNN. And then you, you know you classify whether this is a, a person or not person, whether this is a horse or not horse, and so on. So all this is the label. So the only uh, CNN here is like a classification basically, right? So this is no more than classification here. The important other points is that this region proposal, which is done manually using color segmentation. So you have this color segmentation and for each color, you just uh, put the bonding box. Down. Okay, so net, and then there is a faster RCNN. I think faster RCNN is also invented by Kaiming. So that's why Kaiming is uh, very famous because he just not only uh, invented ResNet, but he also invented faster RCNN. So in faster RCNN, the basic idea is that you have input image, you have convolutional neural network, this is called backbone, that you extract the features. And when you extract the features, you put these features into another network, which is called RPN, region proposal network. So everything here now become automatic. There's no color segmentation, manual color segmentation anymore. And based on these proposals, then you can have a bonding boxes and then you combine these bonding boxes with your feature maps. And then you let the ne another network here to decide whether this is correct or not, whether this is, uh, the, whether the labels are correct or not. So this one is a breakthrough as well, because now everything is automatic, integrated in one framework. And this is still, still step, one of the state of the arts in, in object detection. Although it's published already five years ago, but it is still state of the art. Okay, so that is a fast RCNN, how we can detect object using deep learning. As you can see here, what is the comparison with Fiala Jones? The comparison with Fiala Jones is that, first of all, there is a feature extraction process. This one is called feature extraction. And there is a classification here. Well, we don't really have region proposals uh, in, in Fiala Jones. And that's the addition here in deep learning that we have region proposal network. 
Okay, so another thing is a uh, another task is a depth from stereo. In depth from stereo, the basic concept is very simple in deep learning. So you have input images like these two uh, left and right image, and then you have encode auto encoder. Auto encoder will give you a map, and you have the ground truth. For example, you have a, a label data, and then based on that, you can network in supervised way. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. So how can you get the ground truth? For example, you can use synthetic data. So if you use synthetic data, you will know the ground, the depth ground truth, and then you train the network using synthetic data. So that's the basic of uh, deep learning on deep, uh, using uh, stereo to get. Because uh, it's people modify more to get more precision and more robustness. So now they have two, instead of one network, they have, have two uh, feature extraction. So we have the left image feature extraction, the right image extraction, they are the same network actually, they share weights, the same network. And then there are features here. So once you have the features from the left and feature from the right, then you do the matching based on the feature matching. So the matching is not in the image space, but the matching is in the feature space. And once you have the matching of the feature space, then you can compute the cost volume. Cost volume is disparity. So you have X and Y for the image and the volume, the, the Z axis, is actually the cost, the matching cost for the features. So this is kind of disparity for each pixel, for, for the line, for example, you have the cost for each of the line, in the, each pixel in the line, right? So this is exactly the same. So for each of these, what is the cost uh, for, for the possible matching uh, of the pixels? So when we have the cost volume, then we can have another uh, network, uh, another convolutional network, and we can have the ground truth here to be compared with, and then we train the whole things uh, end to end. And this is more fancy kind of uh, algorithms. Uh, basically, we still have feature extraction. Then we have this cost, cost volume, and this cost volume is uh, compute independently. Uh, and then we can have two map, two depth map from two input image. Anyway, so this is a, a more advanced case of computing the depths. The last thing is optical flow. So this is optical flow. We have a conversion net network here. It's very simple. <laughs> Basically, you have auto encoder and you have the ground truth. Again, the ground truth is synthetic data. And then we can compute the optical flow directly from the ground truth. Uh, the more fancy uh, version of this is called FlowNet. FlowNet uh, use what is called FlowNet S and FlowNet C. So the upper part here is FlowNet C, this is the architecture. Again, the basic concept is quite simple that we have two input images for optical flow. Then uh, we have feature extraction here for each of these input image. And then once we have the feature map, we process using convolutional network, network uh, to get this map here, the optical flow map. And for flow net simple, we can can we can concatenate the, the RGB. So we have RGB uh, in one image, we have RGB in the other image, we have six channels, we concatenate them. After we concatenate them, we give input to the network and and that's you can also get the prediction of this in, of the optical flow. So in FlowNet, we combine this flow FlowNet S and FlowNet C together, then we can have this kind of architecture. How we can judge that this architecture is the best, no one knows. So that's another problem in deep learning, that the architecture is defined by human. Okay, so that's all actually, uh, the comparisons, as you can see here, if you just learn about deep learning, nothing that you can learn. Everything is just black box, right? And you have a clock, you have the input, you put together and then you learn the propagation, that's it. What you can learn actually, the architecture, because you have to change the architecture. For example, the basic architecture is this one. It might not be accurate 100%, so still some errors. So how you, from here, how you can improve the performance? That's the question here, right? How people can, can come up with some idea to, to, to improve the architecture? So how these people use this one, for example, use the flow net correlation 
to 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 design in this way. Actually, this is done. This is inspired by conventional optical flow, right? You have this process here and process there, and then you do the matching here. So this kind of architectural design is the key research in deep learning. So everything is about design. When we talk about novelty, we talk about new, new design. And new design means that you have to create a new architecture. And how can you create a new architecture? What will be the knowledge that you need in order to create a new architecture? The, the knowledge that you need to have is the conventional uh, non-deep learning computer vision. So that's why in this course, we learn about conventional non-deep learning computer vision, because otherwise you will not know how to start uh, doing research or doing work in deep learning. Okay, any questions, anyone? So this is the comparisons between deep learning computer vision and what we learned so far in our course. Any questions? Yes. You talked about the synthetic data as the process. Uh, so how can we generate synthetic data? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. How we can generate synthetic data? So different synthetic data, different uh, different techniques. So for example, optical flow, right? In optical flow, basically optical flow is what? The pixel motion, right? So pixel here in one frame, in one image, and then another one is moving to, to 10 pixels away from this original pixel. So in synthetic data, we know that. We know that this pixel in that person moved that direction because everything is under our control. So for example, if it is cartoon, for example, animation image, you, be, you know that that pixel move from here to there. So then you can compute your ground truth, right? So that's a, a, one way of it is that disparity. You can, you can also know the, the, the corresponding points. Uh, but sometimes we have to generate synthetic data, for example, in my field for, for deraining, for example, or defogging. For deraining, you have to create a rain, uh, synthetic rain. And for that synthetic rain, you have a model. You have to learn about mo the model of rain. So if you have the model of rain, then you can generate synthetic rain. Right? So that's how we can create, generate synthetic data. Not all data can be synthesized though. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so if there's no questions, uh, we are about to end the, the whole things. But before I end this one, I just want to show you quickly about my research, right? So you can see what kind of research that I'm doing. And if you're interested, you can let me know. So then, uh, I, as I mentioned, I have a few positions for PhD. So if you're interested, you can uh, try to apply. Okay, so. It will be quick uh, because otherwise it will be taking maybe another two hours if I have to explain everything, at least. Uh, so anyway, so there's a few things that uh, in my research. So the basic com idea of my research is uh, on on computer vision and deep learning, and the focus is low level vision. So low level vision is about image restoration or image enhancement, and we also focus on bad weather. Uh, and bad weather here is can be low level, can be medium level, can be high level. Low level, you know, right? Low level is try to have input image, output as an image. And the output is better than the input in terms of the quality. That's low level. Mid level is like optical flow or depth estimation. That is a step off from stereo and optical flow is a mid level because the output is still somehow map, but it's not for laymen, for lay persons to, to look at, right? And high level is high level like a face detection that the output can be understood immediately by lay people, right? So there's a different between, and in bad weather research, we, we do all from low level to high level. And we also have a human post analysis and deep learning as well. Okay, so for the bad weather vision, so I just want to show the problem. This is a uh, fog uh, image. And this is the mechanism how the fog is created. So I will not explain this one. It's just to show that there is a mathematical, this is called mathematical model. If you know this model, then you can generate fake fog, 
Okay, so if this is using a physics-based uh, model and using uh, this as an input, our output is that one. So you can see that there's an improvement in terms of the visibility. The far away building is not uh, seen before it become, can be observable. So this one is the input and the output on the left and the right. And this one is a video here uh, taken in real world uh, in our airport. And as you can see that in, on the right, now you can uh, you know, clearly see that it's a car there, lorries here, uh, but in the input image, it's difficult to see the lorries. So this is called uh, defogging or dehazing, or basically just uh, fog removal. Okay, so the next thing is that this is, uh, uh, we apply to smoke as well. So this is a smoke, it's more, not uniform, it's more patchy here and there in terms of the density of the, of the particles. And we remove the, the, the smoke right, using deep learning as well. Okay, so this is an underwater image and then we can improve the visibility. And this is the raining. So if you have the rain image like that, uh, it's quite complex. So if you look at the rain image, actually the information is not, uh, for human it's not really that bad, but if you zoom in, it's really very bad. So then that's the reality that you have to face uh, in, in enhancement. So basically uh, this is the input and that's the output. This is the input and this is the output using uh, rain stick removal. Uh, this is another way we, in our research, we combine physics and deep learning. And this is the problem that we have uh, uh, in rain, not only rain strict, but also rain bailing effects or like something like foggy kind of things. So this is the input that you have rain and then you have foggy kind of feeling in the scenes and this is the output. Okay, so as you can see that in the output, you don't really have the feeling of rain anymore. It's look like after the rain, right? Um, and if you look at the details uh, of this, for example, on the left is the input and you don't really see that is a bus behind, but on the right, you can immediately spot the bus. And basically this is the important things uh, of this research. So this research uh, basically for human operator to see, uh, and it is important for many different applications many systems still have a human operator to see the scene, especially in for security or surveillance. Uh, and, and we work with the surveillance uh, uh, institutions uh, to, to have uh, better, better information of the scene. Okay, so, right. So uh, I just want to skip this one. Uh, and this is uh, based on video that we have very heavy rain, something like this. First of all, we have to remove the rain sticks. So we remove the rain sticks. The rain stick is gone now. And after the rain stick is gone, uh, we improve uh, the visibility by removing the pop, the particles, the, the water vapors uh, on the atmosphere. And this is the video here showing, uh, it's very, very dense uh, in terms of the rain. So this rain here in Singapore, and you see that it's the MRT there. Uh, but there are still many, many information there that we can capture, right? And the right look like there is no rain or no fog, but actually the input is very, very dense rain. Okay, so yeah. And this one is a raindrop removal. So you have a raindrop like this, uh, and then the basic idea is that raindrop is, uh, is when you look at the raindrops, Actually, this is a, like a fish eye lens. It's captured the whole scene instead of certain spot. So as you can see there, actually this is not only just one spot if you look at, but it's the whole scenes are captured here. Right? So raindrops uh, is difficult to deal with uh, because it's capturing the whole scenes. And, and if you look at this one, it's become blurred. Focus is on the, on the target scene. And this blur uh, is not representing any pixels in the scene, it's uh, representing the whole scene, that's uh, the, the problem. In other words, raindrop is actually rubbish, uh, means that there's nothing that you can gain from. Almost nothing there uh, that you can gain. You have to remove it, you have to detect it, and then you have to fill in information from other pixels. 
So that's what we did. Uh, we do uh, this kind of uh, raindrop map detection. So we have a heat maps of the raindrops, uh, and then we uh, do the in in interpolation. So this is the input, this is the output. This is the input is very heavy raindrops, and that's uh, the output. And even for this kind of very uh, uh, dense uh, raindrops, uh, we remove the raindrops uh, almost perfectly. Again, this one is depends on your training data. If your training data and the test data are different, then you cannot get this kind of quality. And that's the problem of deep learning. Deep learning has a problem of generalization. Cannot go beyond your training data. Right? If you want to go beyond, and if you want to deal with many, 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 many types of data, it means that you have to have a very large data set. And only company like Google or Facebook that can deal with this large data set. And that's why the, the search engine is very powerful because they use a lot of data and a lot of GPU powers uh, to process this data. But anyway, so yeah, so if you have a lot of images like this, then it is possible to have a more uh, generalized model. But otherwise, your model will be stuck uh, in the training data. That's your small training data. Anyway, so uh, so we deal with daytime, we deal with nighttime. Uh, this is glow. Uh, so I, you know this kind of image. Then we want to remove the feeling of the glow in the nighttime. So this is the input image, uh, and then we remove the glow, and then we can get better visualization. Uh, this is the input on the left, and on the right there is a roundabout uh, taken from above, actually. Uh, right, so the improvement, you guys can see there. Now we can see the cars uh, on the run surrounding the roundabout more clearly. Okay, so I just skip this one. This is nighttime to en enhance nighttime, and the problem is nighttime is not just low light but also glare here. So there is a glare of of bright uh, images uh, during nighttime, and we deal with this. So for example, if you Look at the background. The background is very dark in the in the behind the scenes here. It's very dark. You cannot see what 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 it is actually, right? And but in the front here, it's very bright. It's very glaring. So now the question is that we want to to brighten up the the back part here. We want to make it brighter, but we don't want this one to be bright as well. We have to suppress the glare. So the, uh, in one image, we want to brighten up but also at the same time, we want to suppress. So uh, we create an algorithm for that, and this is the output. So we suppress the in uh, the front side, but in the back side, we brighten up. So as you can see, the quality is very different because in the back is totally uh, unobservable for us, but then uh, it's now it's nicely observable. Okay. So this is a nighttime glare uh, removal. So, uh, right, so. Yeah, so this is high level of detection. Uh, so I'll just skip. So basically, this one is uh, having, uh, you know, uh, cars and person and bicycle detection in this kind of bad weather. Uh, and we also have a depth from the nighttime. So nighttime is uh, about noise and also about the glare and the bright uh, lights here. So we want to deal with these two. So in one hand, we deal with the low light regions. On the other hand, we deal with these bright uh, regions from the light sources. And here we use a translation uh, technology or uh, image translation. So basically we translate the input image into daytime image. So this is the original input. This is our output and becomes uh, daytime, look like a daytime. So the car is the same car. Well, it's uh, degraded, of course. And also this one, uh, the lamp become a tree. This is uh, called hallucination or thickness in image translation. Because we don't have the ground truth of this data at nighttime, we use unfair uh, uh, training. And this is the called hallucination. It's happened in many, many technology, deep learning technology in translation, I mean. And, and we deal with this. Uh, we try to solve this problem. So this is our input. With our deep learning, this is our output. So the input. The, the lamp here, the, light, the lamp post, still become a lamp post and no longer a tree. 
And this one is nighttime, a very low light. It's, uh, and information here is actually no information because very, very low. And we try to recover that low light. And this is the input. This is the output in that look like uh, daytime. And this is the comparison with the ground truth, the reference day. Uh, of course, it's taken in different time. So the car are different, but the buildings are exactly the same. So as you can see, the this part here and this part here are uh, more or less the same. Although for the low light is very, very dark, we cannot recover the windows. Okay, anyway, so, uh, so this is the one of the things that we combine daytime translation with depth estimation. So this is mid-level mid uh, computer vision. So we also have a depth from fog. So we extract depth using um, monocolor camera in the fog. And we also use optic, uh, uh, deep learning for optical flow in bad weather. So if it is bad weather like this, optical flow will be very bad, uh, like this one, very bad. Uh, but we generate uh, certain techniques to create more robust optical flow in, in bad weather, in, in, in fog and also in rain. Okay, so that's, uh, this is another uh, papers uh, on shadow removals. So we have shadow here, we remove the shadow. So we have shadow here, uh, we remove the shadow. Uh, this is a uh, concept of shadow detection and shadow removal. And yeah, so that's the uh, one topics and the other topics, human 2D, 3D post estimation. So we create a uh, algorithm to, to predict the poses uh, of humans here, even though they are very small or even though uh, they are very crowded. So we create uh, this skeleton uh, for 2D pose. And we also generate 3D from the images uh, from 2D. So this is called 3D post estimation. And even for uh, very crowded places like this, uh, we claim that we can have a robust uh, uh, 3D post estimation. This, uh, there have many applications of this 3D post estimation. Like if you want to have avatar, right? Uh, in, in metaverse, for example, then you need this technology to convert your action to the uh, virtual world. That's one of the application of this 3D post estimation. Okay, so that's uh, the example here that you can have a uh, 3D post estimation uh, from the from images or videos. Okay, so yeah, so that's all uh, for 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 explaining my my research um, and also the comparison between deep learning techniques and conventional computer vision techniques. All right, anyone? Uh, any questions? No questions. Okay, uh, no questions for the exam. So the exam will be, I do not know exactly, it will be on the 20th, I think 22nd, or yeah, around that time, 22nd, yes. Two hours, yeah. Um, uh, the, I think there will be two rooms. You will be split into two rooms. So be careful with the rooms. Um, Okay, so any other questions? Yes. How many people will? No. <laughs> uh, how many people will fail? Uh, it's very, very small percentage. Uh, yeah, it's very small. But last year, because last year was online, right? There's no face to face like this. And the cheating the case make the fail rate very high because there's a cheating case last, last year, 10%. So 10% fail. Uh, some of them actually cannot continue study here uh, because of the cheating case. It means that they cheat during the final exam. Uh, they cheated uh, by, by working together. So I don't think that will, will happen here. Please don't do that because the penalty doesn't worth it. The penalty is very severe. So please try to be honest uh, during the exam. The failure cases is, uh, the fail case is, I, I think is uh, very low. Um, yeah. I think if you study properly, you, you will be okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, so if there is no questions, uh, that's all today for this course. And I hope that you learned something. Uh, and I hope that you can pass this course and do well in your final exam. Okay, thanks everyone. And we'll see you around again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.